Hey guys, what's up? This is Carl, and I'm back with the Orthodox Squad. Today, we're here with Mary and Sky, and we've got a very special guest. It's Seraphim Hamilton. Seraphim, how are you going? I'm great. Thank you so much. Could you start by introducing yourself? What kind of stuff do you like to talk about, and what's your channel all about? Yeah, so uh, my channel is called Seraphim Hamilton. You can find it at youtube.com slash Kabane, K-A-B-A-N-E. Um, I like to talk about uh, Orthodox theology from specifically a biblical point of view. So my emphasis is really on kind of a whole Bible approach, Old and New Testaments, and seeing how the uh, traditional theology of the church really intersects with what scripture teaches. So in relation to that, I do kind of apologetics, general Christian apologetics, and then also uh, engagement with Protestant criticisms of orthodoxy uh, from specifically an exegetical and scriptural point of view. So not so much focusing on a criticism of sola scriptura in principle or anything like that, but more just showing how uh, the Bible taken on its own terms is consistent with what the orthodox tradition says it says. So that was going to be my first question. What does the Orthodox tradition say about specifically the topic of justification? Because that's what we're going to focus on today. How does it uh, kind of differ from what others might think um, it should be? Like, I know um, there's uh, justification, there's penal substitution, for example. What's different? How do we kind of explain justification in our faith? Yeah, so I mean, orthodoxy, obviously, at the center of orthodox theology is the idea of divinization or theosis, where we participate in the actually uncreated life of God. And what I would say is that justification uh, is not a doctrine which is separate from the idea of divinization. It's not that justification is separate, but it's not emphasized, uh, but rather it's that justification is a way of explaining what divinization means within a particular conceptual context. So the word justification and the related words in, in Greek and other languages um, pertain to a legal or forensic ways of thinking. And so to be justified means that you're declared righteous. You're declared to be in the right in God's heavenly law court. But the question is, what does that mean? And how is that verdict realized in the life of an individual person? And the argument that I've made and the argument that I think the New Testament makes is that we are justified when we are raised up with Christ. So when Paul in Romans 5 speaks of condemnation and justification, both of these being legal uh, terms and legal concepts, to be condemned in Paul's way of thinking is to die with Adam. And so by implication, to be justified is to be raised up with Christ. So how is it that Christ is raised from the dead? Well, what Paul says in Romans chapter 6 is that Christ is raised from the dead by the glory of of the Father. And so the idea of sharing in God's glory, that glory which communicates life to the physical body, that I think is what justification is all about. So back in Romans 3, Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, a passage which you know most people uh, in a Christian context are very familiar with. Uh, he's saying more than just all have sinned in two different ways. In saying all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, what Paul is saying is that by sinning, by turning away from God, we have forfeited our sharing in God's uncreated life, and as God is the one from whom all existence comes, that leads us inevitably into death. And then Paul goes on to say, but we've been justified by his grace as a gift, the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Well, it's because Christ Jesus is both God and man that in becoming a human being, he communicates divine glory to the human body and soul and enables us to be raised up with him and share in God's life again. So that's what I think justification really is in the New Testament and what it is in the Orthodox tradition. Awesome. Um, another thing I wanted to bring up is where does, so I know we've got faith and we've got works and we've, we hear this thing solar feed all the time, just for Sky, I wanted to bring that up. Uh, how does that baggage come in for you in general? Cause you come from a protestant background. Um, yeah. So I haven't been, uh, I mean, I was raised Protestant. I'm 30 now and I was Protestant when I was uh, 16. So it's been a little while. Um, but, you know, I would say that we want to distinguish between, you know, the phrase 
sola fide or faith alone, and the doctrine which is signified in Protestant systematic theology. Because the phrase faith alone is subject to a variety of different interpretations, and it's not absent from the writings of the fathers or the medieval theologians in the Byzantine tradition, or even in the Western tradition. But what the Protestant idea of sola fide is generally taken to signify is more than just the words faith alone, it is rather the idea that by faith alone, the active obedience or righteousness of Christ is imputed to our account so that it is counted as if it belonged to us so that God can declare us to be righteous on that basis. So this is an idea of a very extrinsic concept of justification where there is a transference of credit to our account that is not internal to us and that becomes the basis for our declaration of righteousness. So while Protestants talk about an internal transformation, they will generally categorize that as sanctification which is supposed to be entirely uh, or mostly distinct or separate from justification. So what I would say is that rather than talking about justification by grace through faith uh, and works, a better way to understand it is grace through faith through works or a working faith. So the analogy that I found most useful was the idea that if salvation is understood to be you know, a weight which you're supposed to lift, well then faith can be understood to be something like the muscle. And works are when you utilize that muscle to lift the weight. And the Holy Spirit is the one who is operative in energizing that muscle so that you can move it. So it's not that faith and works stand next to each other so that when you combine them both, you get justification. It's rather that faith stands behind every good work so that Paul can say, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Or in Hebrews chapter 11, when Paul is explaining why it is that faith is so important for justification, Paul says, without faith, it is impossible to please God because whoever would draw near to God must first believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And then Paul goes on to list a myriad of examples of people who walked by faith. So faith is the governing principle of the entire Christian life. It stands as the power behind every good work and every good work which leads to salvation proceeds from faith, um, but faith apart from works is incomplete or imperfect. So what James says in James 2 um, is that faith without works is like a body without a spirit. Now, generally what you hear Protestants say is that if you have faith, but you don't have works, that demonstrates that the faith which you have isn't real faith. So the solution by implication is you need to replace that faith with a different sort of faith, which is going to automatically produce works. What the New Testament seems to say by contrast is that if you have faith without works, the solution is not to delete that faith and replace it with something more authentic. It is to utilize that faith to bring forth good works so that as James says, the faith will be completed by or perfected by those works and lead to salvation. Got it. Um, and uh, I was going to say that the thing they often throw around is I think John three sixteen, where it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him has everlasting life. And they try and kind of use that as a checkmate because it says whoever believes, oh, you believe that means you're, you're saved. And, um, you often hear that you, you can't lose your salvation, but we believe that salvation is not a one-time thing. It's something that you're continuously working towards. That's what theosis teaches. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, even today in, you know, modern parlance, if you say you believe in someone, you know, that does not mean this kind of singular act of trust through which something else is imputed to you. That would be a very idiosyncratic way of talking about believing in someone. You know, if you talk about, you know, believing in a particular political leader or whatever, I mean, oh, I really believed in him. I really trusted that he was going to do this and that. And I worked so hard for, you know, this or that aspect of his campaign or something like that. And when the New Testament talks about belief, it talks about the word of God which indwells the mouth so that one is constantly calling on the name of the Lord. It's a much more dynamic and ongoing relationship than it is a singular event through which something else is imputed to you. And I think the really important point that we want to emphasize in relation to Protestantism is that the significance of faith lies in the kind of relationship that it signifies. Faith is that which marks us out for adoption into God's family because faith is the kind of relationship which one has with someone who is one's father. One trusts that God has our good in mind, so one operates out of that trust. 
the idea for Protestants that faith is significant because it is the passive recipient for an extrinsic righteousness, that is something which really has to be read into the text every time one reads about belief or faith or something like that. And when one reads in the Gospels about faith saving a person, it almost is never referring to this moment at which they are converted to belief in God. It rather refers to a moment in which God confers a particular blessing on them because they trust in him at that moment. And one reads about this in the Pentateuch as well. Repeatedly at key points in the Pentateuchal narrative, Israel or Abraham or Moses is called to exercise faith in God by stepping out in that faith. And that is the event in which they are saved. So one sees Israel at the Red Sea, that is when God calls on them to believe in him. And what is the sign or expression of that belief which actually realizes their salvation from Egypt? It is when they actually move their legs and follow follow God and his glory through the uh, sea which has been turned into dry land. So that is the way in which the Bible talks about the significance of faith in bringing about salvation. It is faith in the moment that it operates to bring about movement in following God that constitutes our salvation. That's a very in-depth and I appreciate that. Um, for the other hosts, uh, Sky and Mary, I was going to ask you, Sky, I know you also, you come from a Protestant background. Did you feel like there was a shift when you swapped over? In what regards? Like in, uh, in well, I how think... people kind of acted, because I'm, I'm yeah, assuming because, you went to a Well, I feel like uh, parish. I wouldn't even call it a parish, but <laughs> there's no hierarchy. But um, coming from a. Uh, protestant background is it's interesting because on one hand i was i grew up in like a non-denominational kind of like baptist background which strongly believes in like salvation uh, once saved always saved stuff so um when co coming from that background though i grew up in that parish i always had doubts about that because it didn't logically make sense in my head like i was just like that makes no sense. Um, uh, I guess mainly it's because of the fact that my family, uh, my influence from my family was, um, my dad's side was Catholic and my mom's side, parts of my mom's side had a lot of Anglican influence. So those are two areas that don't really believe so much in once saved, always saved. So growing, so when I was little, I didn't really understand that. And as I came into adulthood and all that, and I started thinking to myself, okay, well, this doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. And then I was like, okay, well, I don't believe one saved, always saved. It makes no sense. And then slowly but surely, it was like an onion. I had to like unpeel layer by layer. And then eventually I started deconstructing that idea of what do I actually believe over here? Started reading the Bible and by the grace of God found a good Orthodox community that decided Amen. to show me. And um, one big major difference that I notice it, between the two communities is I felt like a lot of things within Protestantism were very much like a facade. Like, um, like I felt like a lot of it... Uh, coming from that area i felt like a lot of people were just almost like like uh, like they believe that oh yeah you have to have that faith that provides the works and everything but they were doing all the works for the wrong they were they were doing all these works to show other people that they had the right faith instead of doing it out of love for those people so it kind of it was like it was almost like a an, an exterior only uh, situation whereas within the orthodox uh, parish that I go to it's all backed up by love and it's not the exteriors it's not about exteriors so much as it is putting it up with them but yeah those are the two differences yeah. that I know that I can tell you but yeah uh, Mary I I uh, know you your family is heavily Catholic and I mean it's background wise was Catholic and uh, I just wanted to ask you do you find pushback when you're speaking with a Catholic or Protestant because we live in a Western world at the end of the day most of us live in Western countries do you feel that pushback that there's something you're disagreeing on fundamentally 
Um, no, because um, most of my family on my mom's side, they used to be Catholic, but then converted to Orthodoxy, the ones down in Honduras. Um, but the interesting thing was with my um, dad and his side of the family, they used to be uber Protestant, right? Like my grandma, especially. And um, yeah, they they were, they used to be like, just like, what's the word? They just didn't really know um, out of ignorance, right? The doctrines, they didn't know the history, they didn't know anything really. But um, my dad started getting into orthodoxy and actually met Father Peter Gilliquist, I believe. And um, and he <laughs> apparently Father Peter Gilliquist invited him to pizza and explained orthodoxy to him. And my dad was hooked ever since. And then my dad called his mom, who was, you know, like I said, uber Protestant and was super focused in on like the faith alone. You don't need works. You don't need to do this. You don't need to do that. You're fine. Jesus, just believe in Jesus and you're good. Right. But then he just started explaining some simple parts of orthodoxy and it just like completely shifted her view on things like especially the the something on the the uh Ar the ark of covenant like the theotokos is the new ark of covenant and that just kind of blew her mind <laughs> um but yeah i but i i've i I've seen some of that pushback in my hometown, though, where um, it's mostly Orthodox. A majority is Orthodox, but there is some Protestant denomination still there. It's like there's like 10, 12 churches. You can't go through town with at least passing by uh, three churches. But yeah, there was I, I remember just feeling this, I don't know, careless ignorance or ignorance like the carelessness came from ignorance of like of the faith uh um, like faith alone you know there's just they just don't seem to get it they don't they look down upon the orthodox some of them but there's but there's some that are starting to really come and understand us and like um and um, softening their hearts and coming into the church. Our, th my, my hometown, Orthodox is starting to explode. But yeah, I've seen some of that pushback, but not, I haven't experienced a whole lot of it personally. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I live in Australia, so I, I often have to deal with uh, lots of different religious groups of denominations. And I do feel like sometimes when I'm trying to, talk about the atonement in general i'm talking to someone that that's just completely unfamiliar with what i'm saying um because they have this embedded idea of penal substitution like just you can to some extent um i think find parallels between yours and others denominations but there comes a point where you just have to draw the line and be like but no here i, I just don't agree with you uh, in the Old Testament, though, this is something I want to segue into. Um, something that I find is very important to kind of flesh out is that the Old Testament does have a lot of parallels to the New Testament. Um, for example, when Abraham sacrifices his son, uh, was told to sacrifice his, his son and uh, his only son from his wife, Sarah. And what he does is he is about to do it and the ram appears and he sacrifices that instead. But what's important is that he was willing to do that. Uh, in the New Testament, we see that the father, God himself, sacrifices his only son and is willing to do so. And that's how he redeems the world. Um, how does that come into our paradigm, uh, Seraphim? I'm not too well versed on Old Testament parallels to New Testament parallels, and I'd appreciate your insight. Yeah, so the most important thing about sacrifice in the Bible is that sacrifice is a means of union. And so some people will talk about, I've seen this especially in kind of Catholic discussions of the nature of the Mass, 
in that some people will say, well, on the one hand, there's the traditional idea, which is that the mass is a sacrifice, and then there's a kind of modern idea that the mass is a meal. But that distinction makes absolutely no sense whatsoever in a biblical context, and it doesn't really make any sense in any ancient context. So why is it, for example, that in the New Testament, there are some people who eat only vegetables? Well, the reason for that is you're not going to find any meat in the meat market, which is not sacrificial meat, because the idea of sacrifice and the idea of meal is so intimately connected in the Bible and in antiquity in general. Because when you're eating the same food, you're actually being joined to each other because you're eating the same thing and you are what you eat. So you're being built out of the same stuff. And that's why marriage is always celebrated with a kind of meal, because marriage signifies the union between not only two individuals, but also these two families who are being bound together. And so the first sacrifice, which is described uh, in Leviticus, uh, is what's called in Hebrew the olah, um, what is literally rendered really the ascension or ascension offering. So at the very end of the book of Exodus, God's glory has filled the tabernacle. This is the means by which he is dwelling with the human family in the midst of his priestly nation. God now has a dwelling place on the earth. And it says that the glory of God fills up the tabernacle to such an extent that the priests nor anyone else cannot enter. And so Leviticus chapter one follows immediately on that, even though it's not in chronological order, but in a literary sense, it follows immediately on that because the ascension offering is explaining how it is that a human being who's created and limited can actually enter into the presence and dwell in the midst of one who is infinite and unlimited. And in the ascension offering, the first thing that happens is you lean on the animal. And in leaning on the animal, you are not saying, okay, this animal is my substitute and it's going to go through these things instead of me. So in a sense, we can talk about substitution. In another sense, we have to set it aside. When we talk about substitution, we are not saying that our substitute is standing in our place in the sense that it's going through something so that we don't have to. It is rather that you are being linked into the substitute or more accurately the representative so that you can go through these things in and through that representative or representative. So you lean on the animal and then the animal dies. Now within what most people think of as the meaning of a sacrifice, that should be where it ends, right? The animal dies. Okay, there you go. That's all we really need. But really the ascension offering is about far more than that. Yes, because we've sinned, because we've turned away from God, that is going to lead invariably into death, which means we need to embrace and accept that death. But after that point, after the animal dies, and by implication the offerer in the animal has died, the animal is washed and divided up. And ultimately after being ritually washed, the animal is burned. And that burning is not representative of death. That represents glorification because God's presence is consistently described as fire, especially in the Pentateuch, where a cloud of fire leads Israel through the wilderness and where divine fire dwells in the tabernacle. And so to be burned up means that animal, which is linked in with the life of the offerer because he's leaned on it, that by being burned up, that offer has now been taken into God's presence, or in other words, has ascended into God's presence, which is why it's called an ascension offering. And what follows on Leviticus 1 and Leviticus 2 and Leviticus 3 is Leviticus 2 describes the minka or the tribute offering. And the tribute offering is actually an offering of bread to which wine is added after they enter into the land of their inheritance. They offer bread and wine because having ascended into God's presence, they bring a gift from the work of their hands into God's dwelling place. So if you're invited to someone's house for a feast, you'll usually bring a bottle of wine or something like that. Um, and so it's the same thing when you go into God's house, you bring something from your hands. And we actually do the same thing in the Orthodox Church, which is why it's during the Eucharistic liturgy at some point during that liturgy, you're going to offer a tithe because you're bringing from the work of your hands and consecrating that to God because you recognize that all the work which you do ultimately is empowered by the life of God, which you're receiving in its fullest way in the Eucharistic offering. And then finally, in Leviticus chapter three, and this is all one divine <clears throat> So it says the Lord said to Moses, and then it describes these three offerings. So it's one narrative arc, as it were. So uh, in Leviticus chapter 3, you then have the peace offering. And this is where the Israelite priests actually sit down and consume the same sacrificial meat which God himself partakes of. And so you have an ascension into God's presence, and you bring a gift in your hands, and then you sit down and you share in his life by eating the food which he eats. 
and there's a, a word that is used in Leviticus 1 to 3. It's often rendered offering by fire, but it sounds quite a bit like a lot of the words that are linked with marriage in the Bible, because marriage is being made interior to another person when marriage is celebrated and consummated by a feast. And that's what's going on in the sacrificial system. You're sharing in God's food because you're sharing in God's life. And that idea of sharing in the life of God is at the heart of the notion of sacrifice, and it's at the heart of the notion of what the redemption is in the New Testament. Awesome. Um, gotcha. Um, that's, I think, very in-depth and very concise, and it's very important that we bring up how we differ from Catholics as well, because oftentimes people think that on these kind of issues we are similar to Catholics, which is true. We, we are more similar. It doesn't mean we're the same. There is a difference. Um, the other thing that I wanted to ask is, uh, sorry, just having a bit of a blank. What's the significance of Christ's sacrifice then ultimately in the whole redemption arc, in the whole paradigm? Is penal substitution in and of itself, is it contrary to orthodoxy? Well, as with anything, it always depends on what you mean, right? So I think penal substitution, you know, it's kind of like sola fide or faith alone. As a phrase, you know, you can interpret the phrase in a myriad of different ways, some of which are orthodox and some of which are not. And with respect to penal substitution, I think the way in which most people take that phrase is intimately tied together with the notion of imputation. So if justification is what happens when the obedience or righteousness of Christ is counted to our account as if it belonged to us, well then the inverse of that or the other side of that coin is the way in which substitution is interpreted, which is that the sins which we've committed are counted as if they belong to Christ and he's punished in our place so that we don't have to go through that punishment. So I think that is contrary to orthodoxy. But I think there's a New Testament way of talking about penalty and justification and things like that, which is obviously consistent with orthodoxy. And that's to understand that penalty signifies death. From the beginning to the end of the Bible, the penalty, which is our enemy, is death. So a lot of people take, you know, what is Adam's condemnation? And they think, well, it's eternal damnation or something like that. And we're saved from eternal damnation. But in the way in which these concepts are related to each other in the Bible, eternal damnation is not the primary enemy of which death is an echo. It is rather that eternal damnation is the eternal actualization or extension of death, which is our primary enemy. And so how exactly is it that Christ redeems us from our transgressions? Well, death is what we are subject to because life only comes from God and sin by definition is to turn away from God. So to turn away from God leads invariably to death just by the wiring of what these concepts mean. Um, Christ is infinitely alive, being uh, infinitely God. In joining himself with our nature, he communicates that uncreated life to our created life. And then when he tastes the death that we all inevitably taste, he fills it with life so that death ceases to be the end of the road and it becomes a door to resurrection. So I think the way to contrast some popular perceptions of how the atonement works to the way I think it actually works in the Bible, Christ didn't die in order that we can live, but rather he died in order that we might die with him so that he lives in order that we might live with him. I think that's a much more biblical way of understanding how substitution works. Christ doesn't go through something so that we can avoid it. He goes through what we go through so that we can go through it with him and then share in his life. Gotcha. Um, I think another thing that, so I've got these all questions written down on the list. I'm just going through my list. Um, significance of the resurrection. Why couldn't we just stay in the Old Testament law? Why couldn't we just stay in the Old Testament law? Why did we need to have this point where we Christ came down? Why couldn't we just stay like the, the uh, Old Testament Jews and keep that covenant? Why did we need a new covenant? Well, I think for the same reason that a person uh, can't just always have an 8 o'clock bedtime that's imposed by their parents for their whole life. So, you know, human beings are dynamic and they go through childhood in order that they might enter into maturity and enter into adulthood. And so when the New Testament speaks about the Old Testament law, it doesn't speak about it as something that was bad that needs to be abrogated because it was bad. Rather, it speaks of it 
as that tutor, which exists because humanity, corporately speaking, was in a state of childhood, so that we could enter into adulthood at the appropriate time. So if you look through the history of the Old Testament, you find it's actually not just one thing. So oftentimes we think of, okay, there's the Old Testament period, then there's the New Testament period. But actually the Old Testament period uh, is developing and changing itself. The ritual laws in the time of King David are not the same as they are in the time of Moses. There's been development and change that occurs in the meantime. So if you look at the period from Moses to the time of King David, what is Israel's primary sin? Israel's primary sin is they're going off and they're worshiping other deities outright. They have to be taught to abandon that. And so God hammers that lesson into them by 480 years of constant practice. And they're constantly going after other gods, they're being spanked and then they're coming back and then they do it again and they're spanked again and eventually they stop so that by the time of the kings they're not actually usually worshiping other gods outright they're worshiping the one true god but they often worship him on high places in a way which he's forbidden himself to be worshiped so now having learned to worship the true god they have to learn to worship him in the right way and they go through the same process the kings will take down the high places and they want to put them back up and then josiah has his cleansing but the people don't stick with it then they go into act Exile. When they return from their Babylonian exile, they're not worshiping Baal, and they're not worshiping the true God on high places. They're worshiping the true God at the one place he's designated himself to be worshipped. But now they're worshiping God in the right place. They're crossing land and sea to make a single convert, and yet they have sins of the heart. So in a sense, the external sins are being cleansed away. And as those things are being cleansed away, you get more and more to the core of what's actually wrong with human beings. And that is when Jesus comes on the scene, having learned to love the good and having discovered that the good which they love is good they cannot do, Jesus comes on the scene in order to transform Form our natures so that the good which we've learned to love is good which we can learn to do as well by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is why if Jesus had come on the scene a thousand years prior to the time when he did, it wouldn't have worked in the same way because it wasn't the fullness of the times. And the Old Testament is there in order to create a world in which the New Testament uh, might happen. A friend of mine has described the history of the Old Testament as building a manger. Christ could not have come into the world unless it was for everything that had occurred throughout the history of the Old Testament. And so the Old Testament works in order that the New Testament might come. And so everything in the biblical story leads towards and anticipates and typifies the reality which is inaugurated in the person of Christ. But then by implication, the only way in which we can understand who the person of Christ is, is by really knowing the whole Bible, not just the New Testament, but also all the weird bits of the Old Testament as well. And that really enriches um, our understanding of who Jesus is and what he does. Yeah, I find it um, interesting how um, the, you know, Roman Pax, Rom the Pax Romana came at the perfect time, which is when around uh, Christ was born, because people could live in relative peace then and so you could have christianity could flourish in that if it was if it came any earlier like you said it really would have been just squashed out because of how you know vicious life was in the ancient times and it's something people seem to struggle with is the how like god seemed more cruel or like more harsh and stuff but really it was just that people had were taking their baby steps back then like you said uh, humanity was a child then so god had to speak in a language that people could understand which is just firmness more s firmness that people respected then and then as well as um there was a king uh, he was called the anointed one of god or something like that he was like a pre-messiah figure um uh in the book of isaiah Melchizedek? no not him yeah. it was Cyrus the Great, yes, Cyrus the Great. He kind of he also kind of brought in a lot of like laws and stuff, and he built the temple, and he um, he even based he also wrote like the very first bill of human rights, essentially. And so, yeah, he also ushered in like the he also brought uh, started to build up the time for Christ to come in to uh, of a time of peace. It was perfect for Chris. So.
something I thought was interesting. I uh, remember a topic I was talking about with Mary, something to do with the Romans. I kind of forgot what it was. Do you remember, Mary? I think it was important too. Yeah, speak. it was. Oh, yeah. Um, it was uh, in the book of Romans. It says that um, uh, the law of God is inscribed in the hearts of even pagans. So uh, why can't we just have works alone as a uh, parallel to faith alone? Yes, that's the one. Um, Seraphim. Well, it's because the works which uh, bring salvation are the works of God. And that's what salvation really is. Salvation is living a life which is not a created life. Salvation is living life which is divine. And so what are those works which ultimately proceed from faith and are described as walking with God? Well, those works which proceed from faith faith are works which the uncreated Holy Spirit is doing in and through and with us so that Paul can say it is not I but the grace of God which is with me which is operating in all of these ways or he says I strived with a with the striving that he powerfully energizes within me and so if walking with God is what salvation is if that's what we were created to do then nothing which proceeds from our own heart nothing which we just are producing on our own natural powers can in any way bring that about because there is an unbridgeable chasm between the created and the uncreated which is only bridged by virtue of the incarnation and the communication of divine life to our life that occurs through that incarnation and so that is why it has to be by grace it is by god's initiative and prerogative that this chasm is bridged and it is only by god's divine operation that we can actually live in that way because you can't add it's just like you will never get to infinity by just adding one plus one plus one plus one and you can keep going and going and going but you're at the end of the day you're going to be no closer to infinity than on the day you began so by the same token if you're going to share in that which is infinite and uncreated it has to be on the initiative and by the activity of the one who has that infinite and uncreated life all at once um okay well, that, that explains things, because I know with Pelagianism, for example, there is that denial of the need for, like, baptism. Pelagius was, a, I think, a pope who just said, you know, you don't even need to be baptized, and you can still be saved through your works, but... He was a British... You need, the, you, you, need the, uh, you need the sacraments. And something that I think is lacking in um, or Christianity light, for example, other denominations, is... Uh, the full sacraments so they, they might have baptism and they still chuck they still chuck the pelagianism in there because whilst they got baptized they then don't receive any of the other sacraments because they just deny them entirely um am i correct about this uh Cabain? You can, or seraphim you can correct me in any anyway if i'm wrong uh, about which which point the pelagian um about the part with pelagius he is a pope he was a pope, right? He was a British monk. So, so there are popes oh. named Pelagius, but he was he was a monk who lived in the time of of Saint Augustine. And what he denied is he denied the necessity of grace in order to live a life which is pleasing to God. Um, and so that, from what I understand, is what Pelagius taught. And the important thing about that is that grace is, um, and I think the important thing in in relation to the way we talk to. Protestants and, and Calvinists in particular is that grace actually is not just something which is a response to human sin as if prior to the fall we could have leave, lived a life pleasing to God without grace. Uh, it is simply in the nature of creation that the only way in which it can share in the life of God is by God's free condescension to share himself with the life of the world. And so every step which we take and every uh, move we make in the Christian life can only be done by the operation of the grace of the Holy Spirit in and through us. And that is what it means to be conformed to the likeness of God, to actually walk with him by the power uh, by which God himself walks. So after baptism, because this is what theosis is, after baptism we have to keep partaking in uh, the sacramental life. It's not like I get baptized, that's it. I don't need to do anything else. I'm saved. Uh, I can do good works. No, you do good works, but you have to keep receiving the sacraments. Uh, 
to what extent do we are these other sacraments important after baptism, like the Eucharist? Why do we need to keep taking the Eucharist, for example, after baptism? I think that's my question uh, now. Well, I think uh, come in. So it's, kind of, it's kind of like when you think about any kind of relationship with someone, you know, whether it's a friendship or a marriage or whatever, you know, if the goal is to have a positive personal relationship with someone, just imagine that's your goal with, you know, an individual, you want to be his best friend. You never talk to him, but you go to his house, you mow his lawn every single day, but you've never spoken to him. And 30 years later, you're like, hey, let's have dinner sometime. He's like, I don't really know you. You've mowed my lawn for 30 years. You've worked in that sense, but it hasn't actually served to produce a friendship. But what if you go to his house and you actually hang out with this person and you talk to him and you really express yourself and things like that? Well, in another sense, that is a kind of work, but it's a work which innately leads to the goal to which it is designed to lead to. So the good works which suffice to produce an actual Christian life are those things which intrinsically produce a personal relationship with God. And so what the Eucharist is, is the Eucharist is the marriage supper of the Lamb. God invites us to feast with him at his house, and we feast with him, and in so doing, we are drawn more and more intimately into his life. And it's the same thing with prayer or fasting or anything else. All of these things are important because they serve to draw us actually nearer to God. And because nearness to God is the goal of the Christian life, as Paul says, whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That is why those acts are so important. Um, it is not that we're working and we've worked a certain amount and so God's going to then give us something. No, what we want is God himself. And since what we want is God himself, doing those things which innately draw us near to God is the name of the game. That's what Christianity is all about. Uh, where does the Holy Spirit fit into this paradigm? Because we talked about the Father, we talked about um, the Son. Where does the Holy Spirit come in? And why would something like, well, I don't know, the filioque, for example, dis disrupt that balance? Well, the Holy Spirit is uh, the gift which the Father produces to give to his son. So the filioque, I have some videos on that. There's, It's a really kind of complicated issue. Um, so I would refer people to those for, I guess, a more detailed analysis. But what I would say is that the father-son relationship is perfected when the father gives all of himself to the son in love and he produces the person of the holy spirit in order to give himself through the holy spirit to the son as a complete gift and so the spirit is the spirit of the father for the son and the spirit is the person who expresses the perfection of the love that they have for each other and so the father creates the world through the son for the son and in the spirit and because we are mirrors of god we are images of god and created to be perfected in his likeness the holy spirit who expresses the perfection of the relationship between the father and the son is the same holy spirit whom the father gives to us in order to bring us into his family as adopted children so Paul in uh, Galatians 4 refers to the spirit as the spirit of adoption or the spirit of sonship. Uh, the spirit is the one who operates to bring us into the same kind of relation to the father that the son has in relation to his father. So the son becomes incarnate in order to weave the life of the triune God into the life of the human family. And as the Holy Spirit is the one who expresses the mutuality of that life between the Father and the Son, it is the Holy Spirit who actually does the work of knitting together these two modes of life so that the created mode of life can be transfigured into the uncreated mode of life by union with the incarnate Christ in the person of the Holy Spirit. So then answer. But I'm going to ask the obvious question here that someone that's not new to Christianity would ask, which is, why can't God just forgive everything? Why does he need to do this entire process? Why can't he just say, you know what, I, Adam, Eve, I forgive everything you've done. It's, it's resolved. There's no issue. Why can't he do that? Well, God created the world in order to draw the world into his own life. 
And so the way in which he brought redemption was by drawing the world into himself. But because of the fall, the world became subjected to death and decay and suffering and things like that. But God redeemed those things by fulfilling the original purpose of creation. So this is an important thing to understand, which is that when God created the world and he placed Adam and Eve in the garden, it wasn't as if things were just going to sit in that state forever. God had made a world which was formless, void, and dark. He'd shaped it to some degree over six days, and then he made man as his image in order to complete that ongoing work. Man in being the image of God is God's partner and collaborator in bringing the world to its glory. That was still the project and the plan even after it went off course because of the fall. The project and the plan was for God to make the world his dwelling place. Because the world had fallen into decay and sin and death, uh, and so forth, when God made the world his dwelling place, he incorporated all of that into himself as well and redeemed it in the very act that he brought the world to the purpose for which it was created in the beginning. So I think the answer to that question at the end of the day is not what God had to do or didn't have to do, as if God's hand is forced in some way, but it is the desire of God's heart that the intimacy he originally designed the creation to share with himself be actually realized. And in uh, desiring to do that, the way in which he's realized that is by taking the world into himself in the deepest and most profound way possible. That's uh, where I was going to tie it into my next question. Where does this whole concept of Christ being the second Adam and Mary being the second Eve, how does that relate to this? Why do we need a second Adam and Eve to begin with? What's What's the metaphor here? Yeah, so Christ isn't just the second Adam. I, I like to make this thing. He's not just the second Adam. He's also the last Adam. So Adam himself had a project and a task which he was meant to uh, bring to where he was meant to bring it. Christ, in coming into the world as a human being, he does what God desired to do in the world, but he also does what man was designed to do in the world. And so Christ, in being the last Adam and the head of the human family, he does what mankind was created to do. And because he does it as a human being, he brings us into it so that we, even though we are descendants of Adam and fallen in a sense in Adam, in Christ, we can not only be forgiven for where we've gone astray, but we can actually do what we were designed to do in the first place, which was to bring more of God's glory and more of God's beauty into the world. And so bring things, as the Apostle Paul says, from glory to glory. We call Mary the second Eve. I think most the most succinct way to put it is that God made a promise to Eve, which is fulfilled in Mary. So after the fall, God speaks to the woman, and she isn't called Eve until the very end of Genesis 3, which is something important to remember. She's called Isha, or woman, in all the passages preceding that. Um, God says to her that he is going to bring a seed who is going to crush the head of the serpent who brought death into the world. So that is the promise which is made to Eve. And that promise then marches through the pages of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament can be seen as a large family tree. This is a genealogy of Jesus where there's this promise which is made at the beginning and we are waiting for the fulfillment of that promise and the fulfillment of that promise is being prepared through the whole story of Israel. And then we come to the person of the Virgin Mary and in the person of the Virgin Mary, the Holy Spirit overshadows the Virgin just as it overshadowed the dust of the ground in Genesis chapter two. And it brings the last Adam into the world just as the Spirit brought the first Adam to the world in Genesis chapter two. So God makes a promise to Eve and then it is fulfilled in Mary. And in that fulfillment, we see the meaning of Eve's name because I mentioned that she is called woman or Isha prior to the announcement of that promise. She is called Eve because Adam says she is to be the mother of all living. Now in context, I don't think that's just making the pedantic point that she's the genealogical mother of every human being. The, that name is specifically given in the context of the promise that the serpent who brought death into the world is going to be destroyed. So Eve is the mother of all living because it is through a descendant of Eve that the living one is brought into the world and undoes the damage that the fall did to the world. Um, for those and for those of you watching, something I wanted to bring up also is we don't have a problem with original sin, that word. It's rather the concept behind the word. So don't commit the word concept fallacy. 
uh, and just say, oh, you believe in original sin? I'm orthodox. I believe in ancestral, ancestral sin. You're wrong. Because you'll find lots of Western fathers, they use this word, original sin. It's rather the concept behind what the person means when they say that word. And I suppose that takes us to my, I think, final question that I wanted to bring today, which all ties back to original ancestral sin, is why was the tree even put there in the first place? Why were they given free will? Why uh, why, ten, why was this whole thing necessary? So forget forgiveness, forget um. God having to forgive them. Why give them the opportunity to do something that would need an entire justification and atonement in the first place? Well, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because it is a tree of kingship and dominion. So I mentioned that God created man in order to grow into his likeness. God didn't create man as a static entity who would just sit in the garden forever. Man had a task to do. Man was meant to collaborate with God in perfecting the work of creation. And if you look at the way the Bible uses the phrase knowledge of good and evil, you'll find that it's used of King Solomon when he prays for wisdom to discern between good and evil. He's praying for the wisdom to become king. We find that it's used of Joseph when he's elevated to the right hand of Pharaoh. We find that it's used of the angel of the Lord, who's the pre-incarnate Christ. In the book of Samuel, someone says that the king is like the angel of the Lord, knowing how to discern between good and evil. And so the language of the knowledge of good and evil is language about maturity and kingship and being prepared to reign over the creation. So God placed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden, not because it was bad, but because it was good, because there are virtues which must be learned by patience in waiting for something which is good. Uh, you don't learn patience by being prohibited from something which is bad because there's nothing to be patient for. You're never going to be allowed to murder no matter what. You learn the virtue of patience when something which is objectively good is forbidden from you. And by the act of waiting for that, man is actually prepared and grown up so that he might have the wisdom to discern between good and evil. So we find this is a lesson as made repeatedly throughout the Bible that those who rule wisely are those who are prepared by constant practice. That's a that's a, a point which Paul makes in the letter to the Hebrews, that Christ, by constant practice, learned the wisdom to discern between good and evil so that he could be perfected as a son and bring us into that perfection along with him. And when Adam sinned in taking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he didn't sin because he took something which he was never meant to take. He sinned because he took fruit which was meant to be his, but he took it before it was ready, and so it brought death rather than more life into his life. And what God wants to do is not to take us back to a point where we've never eaten of that tree so that we'll never have to look at it again, but God wants to grow us up so that we can be glorified, so that we can be joint heirs and sons with the Son and inherit what God always wanted the human family to inherit, which is a creation which is irradiated and permeated by his own presence and love and a creation creation in which we live inside the life of the triune God and share in his joy and life and glory and knowledge forever. Well, I think we've all learned a lot from this episode and it was very, very um, enlightening, especially for me. I didn't know a lot of this stuff. I've read a lot of your content before. Before we end, I wanted to ask if you had any final notes uh, and a book you'd recommend that people read on this topic anything on uh, uh justification or you know in my, general any book you'd like well i think one of my favorite books for reading the old testament which i think is is it's a really good it's theologically pretty unobjectionable um uh, Peter Lightheart's a house for my name is a really good kind of survey of the old testament lightheart has been influenced and shaped uh, by a lot of patristic exegesis and uh, orthodox approaches to typology and symbolism and liturgical theology. His book, A House for My Name, is really good. Uh, Michael Gorman has a great book on justification uh, called Inhabiting the Cruciform God. I think that whole book is great, except for the last chapter, which I think is kind of Marcionite. But uh, so with that caveat, I really like that book. Uh, and I'll, I'll plug my own uh, collection of essays, which is Christ in All Things, Essays in Scripture and Theology. You can find that on Amazon. It's linked to on my YouTube. Um, so Put the link in the uh, description below and uh, all your other socials. Great, um, great. So, yeah, so those, those books there. And I think um, 
you know, the, the best way to get into this is to really try to just dive into the Bible and it's going to be really confusing and difficult and weird, but that's a good thing if you're persistent with it and if you really struggle through it and focus on the passages which are really, really opaque and trying to figure them out over time it's kind of like a language it becomes less and less opaque and you begin to see the patterns which permeate the whole and reveal the beauty of christ in every word so i think getting into the bible and not being afraid of getting directly into the bible was probably the most important thing i could recommend to people most people get it including myself get intimidated by the old testament the new testament is like so much more agreeable i'll say when you read it at face value it's like yeah i agree with everything i'm seeing here then you go to the old testament and if you don't get any background it's like what what just happened i don't see the the links but when you understand how the old testament sets up the new testament then i think it becomes so much more meaningful yeah otherwise i want to send a special thank you on behalf of the team Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh we'd be grateful for an opportunity to do this again and uh Once again, looking forward to future episodes and thank you for coming on. Otherwise, that's Carl and the Orthodox Squad and Seraphim signing out. Thanks, guys.